I'm going to try Flip. and find out. Let's have a look. Not... Seen about 25 of them, that's for sure. 1978, uh, it was gonna be Henry Cecil yeah. and Joe Mercer. Correct, it was. <laughs> what, what you, correct, it was. You couldn't remember, I had to look it up. But uh, fair enough. What was the first one you actually remember, Tom? Uh, the first one I remember, Sadler's Wells, I think. Yeah, fair enough. Uh, it, it, in 1984, uh, three, Correct. five months before I was born. So. Oh, there we go. There we go. I was betting on horses before you were born, Ross. <laughs> there you go. That sounds like an insult, doesn't it? Uh, and I was getting in trouble with the police before you were born. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Well, you both inspired me to do both. Uh, but uh, Simon Clare, uh, what was the first? Uh, what's the first eclipse you remember? Um, oh God, probably Nash one, uh, nineteen eighty-eight. Is that right? When he ran down opening verse. Um, yeah, that's probably the earliest. Um, but I mean, I've been, you know, I've, I've been around at Coral since nineteen ninety-seven. So the first Coral eclipse I got attended in a working capacity was was Bill Swadsky's. A defeat of Benny the Dip uh, when Bosra Sham got boxed in in the five runner race. So, when you talk about obviously the four runners tomorrow, we lost Dan Matt, which is a shame uh, yesterday with that bruised foot. But, you know, right from the word go, when in my coral role, uh, it was a small field and a compelling race and a tactical battle up the straight. So, I think uh, it is that kind of race. As long as you've got the quality in there and always what you need is that really big clash which we've got tomorrow, I think it's, uh, it's, it's always a special race. And uh, the coral has been sponsoring us since 1976. Uh, this will be the 48th renewal uh, tomorrow, and we, we, we've renewed the deal, which will take us through to 50 years in 2025. So it's incredible, really, in this day and age when you know people chop and change everything, whether it's sponsorships or adverts or whatever. You know, and um, the fact that it's survived for 48 years and still going strong under the Coral uh, brand name is something I'm very proud. of. Yeah, absolutely, and um, yeah, uh, we were saying the first one you remember was um, the first one you worked was Pilsudski. Of course, it was. Um Michael Stout that year as well. It wasn't even that long ago. It wasn't even Sir Michael Stout. So, <laughs> so there you go. It wasn't. Yeah, yeah. We had a, we had a Derby winner, and it was you know it was right at here in Fallon was who was in the news for various reasons, and uh, sort of was, was sort of blamed for sort of getting stuck in the, on the you know on the rail. But no, it's it's a, it's a great race. We've got, you know the other the little things like it's the only sponsorship I've, I've ever seen in the world where there's a hyphen between the sponsor's name mm. and the race. I don't even know how that even happened or when it happened, but. My um, uh, the late Malcolm Palmer, who was my my, my boss for a while, um, when I joined Coral, it was something he managed to achieve back in the day. So uh, yeah, he he sadly passed away a few years ago. But yeah, me, me and Dave Stevens always feel it's our responsibility to keep the Coral if it's going strong, because uh, he was he was uh, Malcolm was very proud of it. Himself. Okay, lovely stuff. Well, let's hope uh, tomorrow's is uh, exciting stuff. Like I said, small field doesn't mean that it's going to be dull, does it? It never is uh, in, the, in this race. It's amazing how much trouble you can find down that sand down straight in a small field, as we saw last year. Uh, good evening to everyone watching as well. Duncan Evans, David Field, Paul Neary, Doghouse Rowley, Adam Morgan, uh, Emily Lowry and uh, more. But uh, we'll get stuck into that card very shortly indeed. But first, a, a little uh, uh, pointer in the way of the Members Club here at the Racing Post. Right, let's have a look at this send down card then, see what we can uncover. Uh, starting off over the, uh, the five furlong trip, of course, a completely separate track at uh, Sandown, but still the same sort of heartache uh, can uh, occur. Uh, over uh, that uh, that minimum trip, uh, but uh, Carl Burke uh, had a bit of both today, didn't he? He had a really impressive winner, but he also had heartache as Corker threw another race away. But he's got Marshman at nine to two uh, at the at the top of the betting for the Coral Charge tomorrow. Eleven to two is Anaf. Uh, Tiber Flow is eleven to two. Uh, Equilateral doesn't go. Get Ahead is eleven to two. Equality six to one. Russell eight to one. Diligent Harry is ten to one. And we've got Makarova, Lady Juana, and Existent in the field as well. Uh, and uh, like I said, it is nine to two the field. It is five furlongs at uh, Sandown. Uh, it's going to be uh, plenty of horses getting in each other's way. And probably, as we saw today, Keels, whoever can extricate themselves at the right time and come rattling down the middle yeah, should win. Yeah, talk about extricate yourself at the right time. The, the mad dash for the far rail didn't seem to work today, did it? No. Everything that raced on it got beat out of sight. Mm. So, you know, if you think you need a draw in one, two or three, you might be wrong. Uh, all depends. We've got to, of course, warn people that we have a thunderstorm warning. Yeah. Uh, so we could get absolutely tons of rain. The ground was actually soft in places on the sprint course on Wednesday, 
it was probably no no faster than good today, but quickening up all the time, obviously. And if it's warm and there's no rain, it'll be quick. But if it chucks it down, it could easily go down to be soft. Otherwise, I would really, really fancy get ahead of Clive Cox's. Okay. Um, in the hope that it does stay dry, um, I think she's got a great chance. I really don't understand how the handicapper left left her rating on 102 after she just got chinned in the. Uh, group two pre de Groschen at Chantilly last time because she ran past Marshman in the class in the closing stages. She was she was giving him weight then. She was get she's getting a pound now. She's four pound better off, and you know that that sprint track at Chantilly is pretty quick. I mean, it was under fifty six seconds, and she she was in front just after the line. Uh, this much stiffer track. The, this this race is very rarely running under a minute. Um, will suit her down to the ground and she's drawn in stall nine and that might actually be an advantage yeah. this year rather than not. In fact, four, I think four of the last seven winners were drawn six, between six and nine. Um, so I wouldn't be at all worried about that. Um, Clive Cox said to start of the season he thought she might end up being challenging for decent sprint prizes uh, at some point in the season and you know she won very easily at Haydock the time before. Uh, even though I don't think she gets six furlong particularly well, um, that was only in Philly's listed company. But I think she'd bang up to this. Um, Marshman's the favourite. She's better off for beating him last time. But I don't, I don't get that myself, other than the Carl Burke form that you've obviously alluded to. But yeah, I really like her. Yeah, yeah. She's um, obviously same connections that won this with Curious a few years ago. But yeah, I can't really mean. I, can't, I, I kind of prefer. Marshman, because I just think you know a three-year-old in this kind of race, rated as highly as as, as he is, he th th there's got to be a race of this nature in him. He's definitely up to this grade. But uh, you're right. Once you start to dig into it, the price differential does seem uh, a little bit strange. But it is also five furlongs at Sandown, like I said. And uh, Carl Burke is in fantastic form. He's he's had a winner at Beverly. He's had a winner at Sandown. I think he's had four winners in the past sort of 24 to 36 hours as well uh, so there's that to factor in he's also got lady hamana in this as well uh, uh tom who uh, won here at last time out but is drawn in one but again literally anything could happen at sandown i mean ryan Morey rode the winner for colbert today at one point was going to switch to the rail and then came as wide as possible so it, it, a lot of it comes down to the jockey as well of course yeah of course small races are about what happens, aren't they? You know, all races involve them. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I mean, that's a fair point. It's hard to argue with that. Yeah, all races. You know, you need you need things to go very well, and all, especially in these competitive flat races. I'm like you. I slightly prefer Marshman. I just think that he hasn't had anything go right the last three times. I know uh, Get Ahead ran him down, and he was in front, and she ran him down, but he was drawn on the outside, and he's too keen. I think the switch to Ryan Moore is going to make a massive difference for him. I think they're going to hold him up tomorrow. I think that's the key to him because I just I just go back to the Duke of York form. Whereas if you'd stopped the race at the five furlong pole, I'm pretty sure everyone would it would have been it would have been a short price to win it because he was cantering on the far side. And I think that's better form, you know, the Azure Blue High Field Princess form. I just think I just don't think we've seen the best of him the last twice. I'm hoping the switch to this track where Carl Burke does so well and the switch to Ryan Moore will, 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 will bring him out of his shell because I thought he was a really good horse last year and I think a stiff five furlongs will be perfect but uh, you can make cases for loads can't you don't really fancy Tiber flow back at five but uh, I thought get ahead and equality and enough all had chances but I just slightly prefer Marshman I just think there's I just don't think we've seen the best of him yet yeah yeah I'm inclined to uh, inclined to agree to an extent but yeah you don't get many three-year-olds rated as highly as uh, he uh, he is in this grade either uh, so yeah. uh, uh, Race, haven't they? I think they've won five of the last eight or nine. Yeah. And, uh, well, I mean, and, and the, yeah, and the ones that the ones that you know, like Mitt, Mitt Bayer last year was rated 100. You had Mitt Bayer and Nymphadora uh, and Tippy Toes, and they were rated 98, 99, 104. So you know, you've got a horse who's essentially run to half a stone better, haven't you, in the shape of Marshman? So, um, and I think you know, you had horses a few years ago that were rated this. Cause, I mean, he's rated about the same as Batash when it when he won in 2017. So that's the kind of quality that he's potentially shown so far. Well, he looked like that last year, didn't he, when he was ran in the gym track? I mean, I know the mm. form hasn't worked out well, but he does have a penalty, doesn't he? He does have the Group mm. 3 penalty for winning at Sean T. So as Keel says, it, it, it's not easy for him. Uh, I just thought he might be able to, you know, there's a bit more improvement in him. But as you can see, the price there's like a dog race, isn't it? 9 to 2, 11, any, any one of those first six in the market <laughs> would be favourite. Who knows what's going to happen with the market? But I just, I just felt that Marshman was the one with the upside. Okay, 92 then is, uh, is Marshman. Uh, Simon, you've got a, a, a six or seven prize boost. You've probably got something up your sleeve for this race as well. Uh, and um, uh, you've probably got a selection which, like I said, after 
I, th I think we'll all be there at Sandown tomorrow after a furlong and we'll, we'll, we'll know our fate fairly early. That tends to be, uh, <laughs> be what happens in the first race. It's a great, it's a great renewal of this. I mean, normally there's a, a shortish price favour. Be five to one the field, and so many uh, in with a chance. Read really, right the way through the field is brilliant. Um, I mean, over the years, the last ten years, only one twelve to one winner. The rest were thirty to two or shorter. So it tended to you know, polarise around the horse with leading chances. But there's plenty of those in this race. That doesn't really help with that much. Uh, three year olds have won half the half the renewals. Last ten renewals, um, but there's only two three year olds in the race. You point out, and, and Marshman is the the leading contender of those two. So, yeah, it all looks to be very much focused on him. He's now 92 from 5-1. to one. He's the one price change in the last half hour or so. But suggest that he's the one who might be shortening in the market. Um, Ryan Moore, is a, having gone through the races, I fancy, I think, three of his five rides. He's got a strong book. I to see him uh, have a good day tomorrow. And us in the no special, uh, James Knight special, this, he's come up with these. This is a horse from the King stands to win this race. And... It was even money it goes six to four. This is one of those six to four available till seven. And I'm sure, if you work out the price, it's a value play. Uh, Twenty pound max bet up until seven o'clock, and that takes in Marshman and Aparasol and Existence all running for you in that. So six to four, the horse who exited the King Stand to win the Coral Chart. Okay, uh, and you've got another, you've got another one, haven't you? I've just been told by uh, a little birdie in my ear. Is there another six to seven? Have I? What are you there? Is? Sorry, not this race. Sorry. <laughs> All right. I was going to, I was going to, I was going to keep that back to the Coral Challenge, but no, we'll do it now. All right. Uh, okay. Just the because it is, t is a, it is a time it sensitive is. one. Yeah. Yeah. Fair enough. Okay. Yeah. It okay. is a time sensitive. I will deliver it now. Uh, a similar thing again. James Knight said, "Will a horse who ran in the Royal Hunt Cup win the Coral Challenge?" There's a large field of these. Perotto, Uzo, Positive Intelligence, Silent Film, Revit, and Orban. You can have them all running for you. Fancy that Royal Ascot form. Uh, for five to four, from four to five, for the next uh, 45 minutes. Okay, lovely stuff. Well, that uh, gives us a nice little springboard then to uh, to go into the Coral Challenge, a 2.25, the second race on the card tomorrow. Uh, it is a mile handicap, uh, and uh, again, uh, it uh, is a, a race that is uh, is normally um, pretty harsh in running. It is a, uh, uh, again, that, that, that track position as they turn into the home straight, uh, is absolutely vital. But we do have a lot of sand down horses in here. Uh, Indemnify is one from one at the track. He's 11 to two. Uh, Skeptic's 13 to two. Uso's got a half decent record here at 13 to two as well. Perotto's also one from one at the track, admittedly over five furlongs. Uh, he's seven to one. Dutch Decoy's nine to one. Positive's also uh, one from one at the track. He's a 10 to one shot. Silent Film's also one from one at the track. He's 10 to one. Intelligence, 11 to one. Uh, so like I said, loads of uh, proper sand down four. Maysong's two from three at the track as well. So, um, you know, Escobar, always runs a good race uh, over this course and distance as well he's in theory got the run style that should suit if he gets a clear run uh, but indemnify uh, heads the betting here but 11 to 2 the field uh, Tom uh, obviously switched yards indemnify um, from uh, from a, a very good trainer to a, a very good trainer so I'm not sure there's gonna be that much of a an upgrade necessarily but you've got an improving three-year-old like skeptic and like I said you've got loads of course form on the table as well it is as tough as it is every year yeah, it's, it's really hard. Now, one thing I thought is couldn't find too much pace, so there could be even more uh, trouble in running. Uh, I've often seen Sandown's a very good front runner's track, actually. I've always felt it was a good front runner's track up the hill there. So if someone could get in the front, I think Spirit Catch will probably go forward, but there wasn't too many others. But I they normally run at a good pace, this. But like you say, uh, I think, you know, who knows where the best place is. I know they put the rail out today, so the rail back on the inside tomorrow. I don't know if that'll suit the, the low numbers, but a bit worried about them because they're getting all sorts of trouble having said that i do think silent film was underrated in the market you know he was um, he beat run to freedom over this course uh, over seven furlongs i know run to freedom probably didn't stay but he gave him weight and still beat him pretty easily he was second to fresh in one of those handicaps at ascot last year all off the similar sort of mark he ran a blinder in the buckingham palace last time uh when he was sixth or seventh when he got pampered a few times i just thought Ian Williams is one of those trainers that people don't really latch on to for some unknown reason. And I, I think he's, you know, I think he's outstanding. So uh, I just immediately drawn to him, especially with the Will Buick Cup. Will Buick rode that grey horse, Alfred Boucher, to win a big handicap for, for Williams at York, the Evil meeting last year. So I just thought he'd run well, silent film. Bit worried about the uh, inside draw. And after going through it about a million times, I just got the impression that Uzo had to run well. Just had to run well, didn't he? I think he's run three times at Sandown. I thought he was unlucky not to win this race. He's run 
excellent races every time. I thought he was unlucky not to win this race last year off the same mark. He ran perfectly well when sixth in the Royal Hunt Cup. You just know what you're going to get with him, and it's going to be a very, very solid run. And, uh, off his current mark, I thought, you know, I don't know. I don't think I could bet in the race without betting on him because I think there's, there's, there's worries about lots of the others. Skeptic, for example, is going to be put at he's from a wide outside draw. He's going to be have to be put out the back and have to come through the field. And you know, it might happen. It might happen for him, but, it, but that's a hard thing to do at Sandown. So my two were Uzo and Silent Film, but you could make a case for positive and identify and Perotto and loads of others. But it, 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 it's a great race. It always is. Yeah, OK. Then uh, Uzo uh, has a shot says Tom, uh, in the, uh, the 2.25. But yeah, it is. I mean, again, the way the race is going to be run is, is absolutely key. I mean, Skeptic was, I thought, was really impressive uh, last time out. Um, but given a proper Goodwood ride, wasn't he, uh, coming down the, the centre of the track late and, uh, late and fast. Um, yeah, and I kind, of had, I kind of had Skeptic drawn wide, possibly off a slowish pace. And then I quite like Silent Film and Positive drawn one and two. And that tended to make me think, OK, well, something down the middle is going to win and I should probably just leave this race alone. Yeah, it's, it's going to be a messy race, isn't it? I'm, I'm obviously in a massive quandary because one of my big bits of Royal Ascot was Perotto, who yeah. sort of flopped. And, you know, I was expecting a hold-up ride from him there, and he, was, he went very forward, second or third on the standside most of the way in a race where the pace collapsed. Uh, Farrow was in the wrong place, so he probably did OK in finishing 10th, just beating just over seven lengths. He's dropped two pounds. I still think he's incredibly well handicapped. Only thing is that... He was at the five day stage, he was entered uh, both at Haydock and at Chelmsford, I think. Right. So I couldn't back him. I ended up backing a couple of others. And I I mean, see, how many right, times yeah. you want to get involved? Like, you know, it's one, it's one of those, isn't it? Like, you know, and, you know, he certainly won't want any rain mm. if, there, if there's lots of rain, but I can see. The thing see is, him. You, 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 want, you want, actually, it, the ride, it, I can see what's going to happen here, Keels, is the, the ride he got at Ascot is exactly what he didn't want. He'll probably get an identical ride tomorrow. Yeah, at but track, isn't it the first time him? Hood suggests they're going to drop him out because they want him to sell? Mm, yeah. You know what I mean? It's one of those, isn't it? You don't know. So a uh, little bit a little bit of a worry. So end, I've ended up leaving him, and it's one of those that, you know what happens when I really fancy one, yeah. they tend to win next time, don't they? Well, uh, they, and this, this, is the, and this, are, this is the system, guys. This is the system. Are to, um, look at calling the wind. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Cracking yeah, each way yeah. better. Ascot yeah. never had a bean on him at twice the price in the Northumberland Plate, and there he goes and wins. But there he goes, one of those things. So uh, I, you know, he's definitely got a chance. I'm sure he's worked very, very well handicapped, and it'll drop right for him. Whether it'll be there or this day or not is another matter. The two I back were Uzo and Positive. Uzo, Tom's made the perfect case for him. He, he'd have gone very close last year. Mm. He's been first and second on his other two starts at at Sandown as well, and he just runs his race. He doesn't win very often. He's four from 30-odd, isn't he? But yeah. you know what I mean? You've got... I suppose that he's been know. punished for his own consistency. Yeah, ex hasn't exactly, he? yeah. But, you know, there's, 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 you know um, he's, got, he's got to go well each way, isn't he? I, I think, and positive was one that interested me because he, just, he was just down the centre of the track at Ascot in the Hunt Cup. Just, and I think that was completely the wrong place to be. But he ran past everything that raced on his line. Uh, and... Yes, he's rated 105, but he was rated 113. Actually, beat a beat a 2,000 guineas winner, Kamiko, in the Solario Stakes here as a juvenile. So you know he was very good, uh, and I think that run suggested he, he still is very good. And you've got to remember he won twice, uh, um, once in December, once in February, in Class Two handicaps on the all weather. Uh, the latest off a mark of 101. So. You know, I, I think he's he's quite talented if things drop right for him. The only thing was he was scrubbed along fairly early at Ascot. Yeah, he looked a bit he just looked a bit slow, didn't he? Yeah, Rich? and he really you know, and he really did fly late and if they do go steady he'll probably get run off his feet yeah. um in the closing you know, in the in the second half of the race. But uh, uh the only one I've ended up putting up tomorrow in the paper is Uzo because I think he is he is the one horse guaranteed to run his race. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough then. Uh, Uzo is a 30 to 2 shot. Both our pundits uh, agree. But yeah, the more we talk about this race, Simon, the, uh, the harder it gets for me. Maybe I'll, be, maybe I'll just play it simple and, and take the prize boost uh, after all, because that covers at least half the field. <laughs> exactly. I like that. Yeah. I mean, we're paying the extra place, four places, even though it's 15 runners. Um, fascinating, actually. This is a race I love, obviously, you know, on, on our big sponsor day. But, but what is generally a competitive handicap, you know, usually she's got 13 or 15 runners. Five wins in the last 10 years, 10 years have started nine to or shorter. There's only been a couple of double figure price winners, both 16 to 1. So, quite interesting, even with that, and even with that sort of potential trouble in running, that actually, you know, fancied horses or well fancied horses have, have won 50% of this, uh, this, this race. And 
Um, and, you know, I, Alice Haynes is a really talented young player. She trained for the Coral Racing Club. Um, our our two-year-old we got with her aspire to glory ran at Yarmouth. A nice race. And we'll now get a handicap mark. So hopefully we will be uh, getting competitive. Not that we weren't trying to be competitive. But, um, but, yeah, she's a great trainer. She picked up this horse in the uh, golf sale the night before Royal Ascot. in led down to five for the Roger Varian Yard. It's, it's looking solid at the head of the market. Obviously, got that decent Sandown form. And, and rather on a May song, at the moment it won at Sandown back in June, um, uh, her, one of her, her, her child, Starley, who works for her, called me up actually and said that the, and said it, that you know, the target was going to be this race because it loves Sandown. A couple of nails. Drank quite well at Hamilton a few days ago. And I think, yeah, I think he'll go well again and probably will be ignored the market for it. So those would be the two for me. But yeah, no, it's a fracking renewal of this. No surprise, Uzo has been trimmed in 32 from 15 to 2. In silent film, 10 from 11. Thanks to Siegel for something. Okay, there you go. All right, so a, a big field as ever for the Coral Challenge. Uh, Dutch decoy to swoop home late for the win, says James. Uh, uh, so, I mean, again, this is the thing. I mean, literally, uh, it, it wouldn't surprise me in any way, shape or form if any of these won. Uh, and I reckon everyone uh, out there has affected at least one of these. So indemnify 11 to 2, uh, favourite then for the, uh, the 225, the Coral Challenge tomorrow. Uh, moving on then, uh, over the, the mile again, we've got a little bit of a taster in that race to see how, uh, where you want to be. And, uh, and uh, hopefully your, uh, uh, your runner will get that ride in the, the distaff. Now, Breeze has been pulled out. Obviously, Copies was favourite for this earlier in the week as well. So those two have gone, uh, which has left uh, Stenton Glider as the favourite here at 5-2. to two. Magical Sunset is 7-2. to two. Bridestones is 4-1. to one. Baxi Dar is 13-2. to two. Uh, Celsa Beeler is 9-1. to one. Maggie's Way, 11-1. to one. Crystallium, 14-1. to one. And then a few horses uh, uh, maybe tilting at windmills. Uh, Mystic Pearl rated 78 here for William Agus is uh, potentially going for some black type. Lady Alara and Miss Jungle Cat as well have a bit to find. But again, uh, they are both from yards in form in the shape of the, uh, the Charlie Hills uh, and Carl Burke stables. But again, this race has, has kind of collapsed um, in terms of the, uh, the way, obviously, it's been priced up and how people are going to uh, analyse it, Keels. And I kind of feel... I kind of feel Stenton Glide has kind of fallen into that favouritism position. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's one of those, wasn't it? I think there was another one that was well up there in the Antipodes, but that didn't uh, get there. I can't remember the name of it. But uh, yeah, obviously, Cop East was a strong favourite, and then we had, uh, and then we had Breeze come out. So yeah, she probably does deserve to be favourite. I don't think her form's frightening. Uh, obviously, the second to the remark earlier in the mm. season is, is fine. Um, so she does deserve that place in the market, but these sort of races frighten the life out of me, these three-year-old fillies listed races, because they can improve in sort of leaps yep. and bounds. And you mentioned William Agus, he doesn't throw his entries away, does he? No. Like, you know, so you, the one thing you know is you can bet your life that that filly is miles better than 78, whether she's going to be They're not having a social not. runner, are they? No, exactly. No, no, no. It's, <laughs> it's not the Haggis style, is it? Um, you know, I think the, uh, I, you know, one of, one of the obvious ones is Bridestones, who, uh, got in all sorts of trouble at Ascot, but I think Tom's ruined the poorest price on that one. <laughs> I went with, uh, I just thought I'd take a chance on Maggie's way. Now, she only won a handicap off of about a 78, uh, but she did it very, very easily in, in real style. It was like the two lengths and then and almost four back to the third. Both of those have run really well since. Yes, she's got an awful lot to find on that, but you know, in two months, in the two months she's had off since, uh, you know, Connections have decided, well, we'll go here and we could risk finishing fifth uh, and go up £10, mm. uh, like, you know, but we're going to go for it. So they obviously think she's pretty decent uh, and it wouldn't surprise me if she leaves that mark a long way behind, although she's going to have to. Yes, uh, she is. Uh, yeah, she's another one of those ones that could run an absolute blinder and still finish fourth, isn't it, in this case? Yeah, exactly, race, and, and completely ruin the handicap mark. But, yeah. but you know, I, I just think it's, I, I think it's worth trying because, you know, the problem with the three-year-old fillies is they can improve in absolute leaps and bounds. Yeah, and uh, I mean, she was sent off favourite for a novice event at the back end of last season, which was won by Perdica, who is a list of class. Yeah, who is, a, so. yeah who, who is very good, yeah. And then for some reason she was, you know, she was 12 to 1 last summer at Nottingham, but I mean, yeah. she won like an odds-on shot. Uh, you know, so let's wait and see. I've had a few quid at, I've had a few quid at double figures anyway. Okay, Maggie's way currently an 11 and 1 shot. Uh, but I'm, gonna, I'm just going to throw something to you that we, we said about the, uh, the last race uh, here, Tom. And I, I couldn't see a great deal of pace. And given the way that Carl Burke's horses are going, given that she really improved for the mile at Newbury last time out, I thought Baxi Dar, who's a little bit of a keen goer, but is going to be ridden prominently. And she kicked on a long way from home at Newbury and just kept going and going and going. And I thought she was quite interesting at 13 to 2. Yeah, I think I, th I thought so too. I thought her two year old form was pretty good. It was quite progressive as well. Uh, I thought Newbury was perfectly suitable for her. I, th I do get the Stenton. I do understand why Stenton Glider's top of the market. Uh, the 
German Guinea's form, I know we sort of poo poo sometimes the German Guinea's form, but uh, the, the winners running in the uh, John Pratt on Sunday and Dreamer Love had a very good race off a big weight in the Sandringham. She was, she was sixth or seventh, so she beat her three lengths. So you sort of you sort of get why she's at the top of the market. Uh, that was on fast ground too. I had her down as a as a soft ground horse, but a uh, soft ground filly. But that was on fast ground, so shows she can handle it. So I get why she's at the top of the market. Uh, Magical. It's one of those races, Ross, where it's the, the 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 thunderstorms it will make a massive difference because there's about four or five that I think would really like rain. Magical sunset, heels as horse you mentioned, scent and glider to a certain extent, uh, you know, and and then there's ones like Bridestones and Sel Sabila or whatever it's called of uh, Roger Varians that probably wouldn't want any uh, any rain on to keep it fast. I ended up in Bridestone simply because I'm a, I've, I've been following that Gosden. Uh, uh, run in a trial theory to, to pretty good effect so far this season. Copies, uh, although I didn't back her the other day, but she's come out and won. Mostabshire, who blew out in a trial, came out and won at Evil, and obviously Soul Sister did the same. Bridestones ran in the same race as Soul Sister, so they're a very similar price. They're six or seven to one to win the what was the Fred Darling at Newbury. She finished well in front of Soul Sister. Next time she went and ran in a grade one, a group one in France, mile and a half, mile and a quarter soft ground. That wasn't a good. That wasn't any good to her. And then the last time in the Sandringham, it's a total throwout run as well, isn't it? Because she literally got knocked over two furlongs from home and still ran on to be third or fourth on her side. So I thought she was the one that was going, was probably potentially still could be top class in the field, whereas I didn't think any of the others had the potential to go to the places she had. But the market reflects that now. It's all a bit of guesswork. I also thought Sel Sabila was a bit overpriced because that was her debut in the Sandringham. Mm. And she pulled it hard and that was a reappearance and she's finished in front of Bridestones just behind Magical Sunset I'm a bit worried that I think a mile might stretch her, I think maybe seven furlongs is her trip because she's quite keen but I thought she could run well but look, I was looking for the horse that could be, I always like to look for the horse that could win by miles and I think Bridestones is the one that could win by miles but there's a bit of guesswork involved because she's hardly, you know, she's been seventh tail last and eighth in her runs so far this season so, uh you know, I was hoping she'd be a bigger price than that. And uh, earlier in the day, she was a lot bigger than that. But there we go. That's when I came down on Bridestones. OK. Yeah, and the, the horse you beat on debut at Yarmouth has just been beaten seven lengths uh, at Haydock yeah. off a mark of 72, literally 10 minutes ago. So, like you said, you're, you're, you're banking on that improvement, aren't you? Uh, but, yeah, I, 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 I know the one that could win by a, a long way, but I do think the backseat are potentially is in that category. You know, you've got a lot of horses coming into this off the back of, well, I'll make an excuse for this, make an excuse for that. She, she improved for the miles. She comes from a, a family of Godolphin horses who had, you know, listed and Group 3 and Group 2 form all over a mile. And, um, like I said, she's drawn in six. She's a very prominent runner. I can see her kicking on and playing catch me if you can, and hopefully they won't. But um, that, that, that's the the distaff. And again, it is, I think, sort of the last 10 years, Simon, I think sort of six horses have made all, and the last couple have been very prominent as well. Um, a lot of these races, jockeys look around, horses look around, they think, right, who's going <laughs> first? And then suddenly one's quickened up the, uh, the sand down home straight. Yeah, no, this, is, this looks a really good renewal of this race. I mean, if I know, we, we touched at the start of the fact that the is obviously a very small select field, but the, the first three races, the Coral Charge is a cracker. Five on the field, the Coral Challenge, you know, very competitive renewal, and then there's Coral Distaff, the same. You know, you can make cases for lots or you know potential, you know, for lots of the fillies in this. And um, we're going four places as a result, even though it's sort of obviously I'm not how many runners it is. But anyway, it's four four places each way. We've got a special on Stenson Glider to win by over a length. Uh, so Stenson Glider to win the race by over a length, thirty two five to one, and the last two winners have won by two two lengths, three lengths ish or whatever. So you know. Can be done. Um, we, we, uh, some people will know, some of some won't. We now sponsor the uh, Michael Owens Manor House Stables and Hugo Palmer uh, operation up there in Cheshire. And, and Hugo is writing a blog for us ahead of all the big sort of weekend races. He's actually got runners at uh, Haydock, Leicester, Nottingham and Carlisle tomorrow. So you can catch up on those runners from the Palmer team on the News Coral website, where his blog is. But on Stenton Glider, he said she picked up a little cut after a run of the German Guineas. The ground was very quick there. That's why she missed Royal Ascus. But the form of that remark, he second in the Fred Darling, looked strong. And although she thinks she's drawn slightly wider than he wanted at 10, I think she goes there with a big chance. So, uh, out of blind loyalty for the correspondent team, I'm firmly in Stenson. 
Okay, Stenton Glider then is a 5 2 shot or 13 to 2 to win by over a length for the distaff. Uh, and of course, uh, the, uh, the next uh, race on the, uh, the agenda is the, uh, the Coral Eclipse. Um, again, a small field, but a, a cracking renewal. Uh, and like I said, it is, it's always a fascinating race in the calendar because of uh, the, uh, the matchups of, uh, of not only uh, generations, but also uh, you know, Colts versus Phillies and Mares as well. Some horses stepping down in trip, some Miler stepping up in trip. Um, so you always get a fascinating clash, Keels. Is there, a, is there an eclipse that stands out for you over the, the past 20 or 30, 40, I don't know, you can go back and look like, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, it was, a, it was a redemption for Dancing Brave after getting beat in the derby and, mm. and coming out. And it was, it was Greg Greville Starkey's last ride, I think, in, in the eclipse before Pat Edwy got on board. And uh, he just absolutely cruised through and trounced, tripped it. She was a, a real globetrotter and she was, you know, she was top class. She won stack of group ones herself. And, was always thereabouts. He made her look very ordinary, and I think we saw what a really good horse he was then. Um, I wouldn't say for the first time because he hacked up in the guineas, but he just confirmed it. Uh, you know, so yeah, I loved it. It's a long while ago. A lot of people won't even remember it, but go and take a look if you want to look on YouTube because he was he was very very good. Yeah, although the, uh, the, the one of my big memories in the race is is the one you can't really watch on YouTube, or you can watch it on YouTube, but it's not now Cato who. Isn't you can't actually watch no, him with it because they don't, he's not in the camera. He's not in the camera. Ryan Moore came <laughs> all the way over to the to the stand side. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, and he, and he was a you know he went off a big price, but he was a genuine yeah. top class Group One horse, and he beat Authorized, and he beat George Washington, and um, yeah, I remember and backing did, him and it, thinking uh, and watching the race and kind of thinking, what was he on? What the hell is going on? Yeah, he took he, you know took advantage of better ground. Now, what happens if it chucks it down with rain tomorrow? Will, that, will those sort of tactics? When he got four runners. I don't know. One of them try, and I think rain. You know, rain is important because, you know, to all intents and purposes, if it stays dry, this is a this is a match between the yeah. three-year-old colt going up in trip and the four-year-old filly coming down in trip. But if it was to absolutely, you know, if they were to get the the thick end of what you know they were suggesting is possible with thunderstorms, both the other two both like a bit of cut, and while west wind blows is rated 111. Um, uh, Dubai Honor is rated 122, which makes him one pound inferior. To Paddington, two pounds superior to to um, Emily Upjohn, although she's obviously getting three pounds from him. So he's right in there, dual grade one, dual group one winner in Australia uh, earlier in the season. He's got, I mean, he's got. The, he's, he's the absolutely. He's a Dave, isn't up he? Yeah, he's, absolutely. Gagged, yes. he's a, yeah, he's a Dave Mark too, isn't he? Like you know what I mean. So if it was to get really soft, you know, it'd be interesting. But I don't think he can possibly win if it doesn't. Yeah. Uh, and you know, it's it, it's one of those two. Who do you like the most? I mean, um, at currently the price at Paddington's ten to eleven. Emily Upjohn's eleven to eight. And then Dubai Honor is eleven to one. And Westman Blows is, is twenty two to one. And you know, earlier in the week again, Paddington was what seven or two, four to one. I think. Yeah, it seven or two, four to one. But there were doubts about whether he was going to run, wasn't it? Once yeah. it was once it was confirmed, that was it. Is it? You know, he shortened, and I think it was always going to likely to go off favourite. Um, I don't know whether he should be. He gets that weight for ages, and he? he's getting seven pound. He, you know, he's very, very good. Um, that that win at Royal Ascot was very, very good. He's got to prove he stays, but I mean, he's bred too. Looks like he will. Um, but you know, Emily Upton is no mug at all, is she? When she's on her game, that was a real sharp turn of foot she showed at, uh, at Epsom in the Coronation Cup. And dropping back in trip too far along is not going to bother her at all. I think it's fascinating. Yeah. Uh, I don't want to choose between them. I'm not going to have a bet. I couldn't say to you one way or the other. I really like this one over the other one. I mean, you want to see them, yeah, head to head, a couple of furlongs from home. Yeah, it'd be great. I mean, you know, imagine imagine if they're both really quickening. They go away. They go ahead from you know two serious horses mm. and pull miles and miles clear. Whether that'll happen because it, you know it's going to be a tactical race, isn't it? Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, yeah, in theory. Yeah, I imagine. Mean, I mean, West Wind blows could. You know, I was going to say, part of me thinks could, that Jamie Spencer could might just poach an easy lead. Well, he might. He poach an easy lead on a horse that fairly comfortably stays a mile and a half and might mm. just go right and wind it up and wind it up and wind it up. Mm. I could almost see Jamie Spencer trying mm. to do that because he's yeah, very good I mean, when he gets to do that. I did think about that initially, but then you go back to the amount of ground Emily Upjohn made up at Epsom and how quickly she did it. Yeah. And I just think, you know, she's just going to be too fast to fall for her, isn't she? Mm. You know what I mean? Uh, Emily Upjohn is an 11 or 8 shot, I said Paddington 10 to 11. Uh, but uh, yeah, uh, just the, the four runners here, uh, uh, Tom. But um, again, it's... It, it is fascinating because, like I said, you've got you, you've got mile and a half horses versus milers versus ten furlong horses. It's um, and I, I also want to say earlier that anything can happen in a small field. Do you think that's true, Tom? Or I almost think that the class comes to the fore even more then. Yeah, it's, it's, 
anything can happen in any race. But if you know, uh, for me, it's it's dead straightforward. Emily Upjohn's going to win, isn't she? I just I just think she's absolutely top top class. What she did at Epsom, I thought, was extraordinary. Thought the time was exceptional. It was um, like three or four seconds faster than the the Oaks. She showed an amazing turn of foot. I think that's really strong form. Paddington. I think we'll stay the trip, but I'm I'm just a little bit wary of the three-year-old Colts that are mile this year. I'm not still convinced they're that good. He is clearly very good, and he is gonna he is gonna stay the trip. But I think she's exceptional. West Wimblow's got no chance, and do I on her only wins if it absolutely buckets down, isn't it? Doesn't it? And we don't want it to bucket down. We really don't because we want the proper horses to come to the fore. I personally think Emily Upton is. Uh, probably the most exciting performance I've seen so far this season, I think, uh, bar none. And uh, therefore, I, I'm, I'm, I'd love her to win. I'm a big, I'm, look, I'm made it well clear that I'm a big fan of the Gossens. I love the way they train. I just love the class factor that they that they instill in their horses. And I'd love to see her win. Because I think she deserves it. Because I think she should have won the, the Oaks last year. And I think she's, I just think she's really special. So I think she'll win and I really hope she does. Okay. Yeah, and obviously it's a, this is you know this is a this is a Gosden race, isn't it? As well, it's not really a Bally Doyle race, is it, Tom? They, you know, apart from St Mark's Basilica, it's been fairly fairly dry on the winners for them. Well, going back, they've won it a few times, haven't they? But... I, mean, I mean, in recent years, I mean, I mean the horses just, they send over in the recent six, years. Just the six times. Just the I know. Six times. I mean, well, yeah, but not for. <laughs> I mean, in recent years. I mean, look. I know. They okay, if, they, if they win this race, if they if Aidan O'Brien wins this race, he becomes the leading uh, the leading. Uh, Winning most trainer in the races history, I think. Yeah, but he's only. And what was okay? I'll rephrase that. He's won it. He's won it once in the past decade. They have. They. They don't either. Yeah. They don't send that many over to, to challenge. But doesn't this he race. win it more often than Phillies win it? Yeah. I, 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 yeah. I, Gosden Phillies. <laughs> I don't, look, Only right, three I was just, I was just saying, have ever won the race. Yeah, I was know. just saying, in the past ten years, it's not be, it's not a race where that that Bally will come over. A lot, you know, there are a lot, a lot of races where it's Gosden versus O'Brien, and this race, it, it, they they haven't sent that many over. They've won it once in the past decade. I'm not saying there's not been as many as classy as Paddington, but I'm just saying they've often sent one over for a, just to have one in the race or whatever. But you know, Magical got beat in this and. Um, Decent horses have been beaten from from Bally Doyle in this race. I know you've all absolutely piled on me there. Saxon Warrior got beaten this race. They have, you know, they've they've had good horses beaten this. Yeah, of course That's they have. Passion got... defence yeah. of my, uh, my my comment there. <laughs> but I think what we got to say is the fact that Paddington's running has made the race, is not it? Because yeah. if it in Luxembourg oh, yeah. would have been the most, you know, sorry, side, but it would have been a dead boring, wouldn't it? A dead yeah. boring eclipse if it would have been four older horses. Uh, you know what I mean, but Paddington has made the race. So the fact that they're coming over, I don't think. I think. I think Ross. I think they they do like the Eclipse. They they, they do want to come here with, and win the Eclipse. And so, I think it's brilliant that Paddington's coming over. I just hope he gets stuffed. <laughs> Fair enough. I'm not saying. I'm just look. I'm just uh, look, like I said. They had Cliffs of Moa was sent off favourite. I'm not saying Saxon Warrior was sent off nine to four. Got beat. They both got beat. Magical was beaten at eleven to four. Uh, Japan got beat in this. You know they they. They, they 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 always send one over, but it just doesn't. The past ten years, it's not really worked out from that much. That's all I'm saying. That's all I'm saying. So and it's actually right now. I did. I, and I look, listen. You're absolutely right. I had looked. It was interesting. I didn't realise it was such a long time since between winners for the match because I noticed that uh, as I was looking through the records that Aidan O'Brien is going to this record of becoming the winning most traded. But like you said, it's been a lot of those wins were in the early years. Giants, Causeway, Hawkwing, Oratorio, beat Motivator, and Motivator was odds on Mount Nelson. One and then so you think, and then it was a big gap to some Mark Basilica. So uh, um, you're right. I mean, it, listen, it's a cracking race. It's interesting hearing the guys talking. I'm sort of Paddington seems to be the one attracting all the money. Uh, it's ten to eleven from evens this evening. I wonder if there's going to be you know real sort of market confidence behind him tomorrow. I think the weather watch is important. Paul's pointed out. Um, and Emily Upjohn, Upjohn reps. She didn't really run one bad race. That was yours last year when she ran two free. Besides from that, she's been brilliant, and she's still relatively unexposed. We haven't seen that much of her yet. So she could be one of the most exciting horses of the season. So, you know, you've got to buy honour on ratings who who's, who's deserves to be there and West Wind Blows. I'm glad they're rolling the dice. And, you know, the, the, the end of those specials, actually, James Knight's priced up to finish last. He's clearly got an angle on this night. These, one of our end of those specials is West Wind Blows to finish four. It's even money from 8 to 11. Now, you look at the market, most people would think 
Well, it's definitely going to finish fourth. You know, it's, it's well behind the other three on ratings. But I think James must have a view. It's going it, to, you know, that, 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 that it's going to run better than his price suggests. So that's either one of the other no specials. Other ones, Paddington to win by over three lengths. That's 9 to 57 to do. So if you think Paddington's going to win impressively, uh, 9 to 2 to win by over three lengths. Emily Up, John, same thing, to win by over three lengths. If you're in her camp, I think she's going to blitz the field to win by over three lengths. She's 5 to 1. And then you've got Dubai, Honor, all West Wind Blows put together. Uh, either of those to win, 7 to 1, 6 to 1. But, um, two works out a reasonable value. So they're the end of no specials. Thrilling race. I'm probably in the Paddington camp, favoring the three year olds over the older horses, but uh, it's largely going to be a watching race. Great one. Yeah, it is. And I mean, you surprised here. I think Paddington's going to win, but. <laughs> just, <laughs> you're, still, you're still smarting <laughs> over this, aren't you? I was just saying about the record. I was just saying <laughs> on the record. I, th- I think he's going to improve with the trip. I think, I think he's, I think he's yeah. been underrated the way he's won his last two races. I don't. Like I said, maybe the ones in behind aren't absolutely top class, but it can, tends to happen every year. You're looking for the three-year-old in that division who's who's cut above the rest, and the, the others kind of disperse into slightly lower grades. But Paddington does look to be mm. a cut above the rest, so he is the, you know, the uh, the standard bearer for that generation. So um, not that I back him at ten to eleven necessarily, Keels, but um, hopefully it'll be a cracking race anyway. Oh, hopefully it will. Yeah, I have no idea what's going to win. Huh? Well, fair enough. <laughs> uh, well, I'll take Paddington, Tom. Can take uh, Emily up, John, and um, decided vote goes to. Uh, I think you're with Paddington as well, Simon. Yeah, I'm a Paddington. I'm a Paddington man. Yeah. Listen, who was your favourite uh, ever Corricutts winner, Ross? Well, like I said, I mean, for, I guess financially it was not now Gato. That's the thing because of that. That I remember having that that bet and thinking he's, he's a bit big on the on his recent uh, recent form, the international and so on and so forth, and didn't actually see him win. Um, most impressive, I think, was, was had to be Golden Horn. Really, I thought he was he was just. Imperious in this race, but um, more. I mean, like I said, I mean, Tom seen 40, 40 M- more to- eclipses than me. M Toto, oh, that was a brilliant day. That was when he beat Reference Point. Reference Point won the what did he win? He won the uh, Dante, the Derby, the Voltager, the Saint Ledger, and the older horse came past him uh, in, uh, in, the, in the eclipse. Brilliant day that was 1987. M Toto, my favorite ever flat horse. There you go. I was say, my favourite ever flat horse was Pebbles, and she also won this race, 1985. Yeah. Beat go. Rainbow Crest, who uh, won the Ark later on, albeit in the stewards' room, but it doesn't matter. Yeah, she was mm-hmm. the first filly to ever win it. Yeah, and Toto won it twice. He won the following year as well. He won the That's King right. Ford. Big We're just old gits, basically, Tom, aren't we? We don't like yeah. all this recency <laughs> nonsense, do we? Yeah. They were, they were beating proper horses, weren't they? I mean, they were beating the Derby winner and Trip Dick and horses like that. You know, they were proper. Absolutely. Just to be fair. Yeah, no, you're right. And when they were winning, I, I mean, I was having a cracking rusk. Uh, I really was. <laughs> 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 but uh, anyway, oh. uh, but, uh, we've had a few, quite a few comments uh, on you know their favourite uh, eclipses on the Pebbles was a cracker says Jim Stanton. Uh, Doghouse Riley said that uh, the Gurkha should have won the eclipse. Um, <laughs> uh, best ever uh, I've seen it says Alan Keane is, uh, is see the stars. Uh, and um, as for the uh, the rest, uh, what else have we got? Yeah, plenty of see the stars. Uh, folks, there was just something about see the stars. I mean, the way he went about his races uh, was pretty uh, was yeah. pretty special. It, um, it kind of simultaneously seems like last week and you know an entire lifetime ago. Um, and Toto cost me plenty in the arc, says John Kerr. <laughs> and Giants Causeway beating Kalanisi was a hell of a race. Mm. Uh, but uh, we've got uh, three more races on Saturday's Sandown card to uh, to get through. But Paddington ten to eleven, Emily up John eleven to eight. Uh, is it a match? In the eclipse tomorrow, uh, it would be nice if uh, if all four at some point had a, ch- a chance, and then we saw a, a really clear-cut, impressive winner of tomorrow's Group One feature. Uh, as for the uh, the last three races tomorrow, um, a couple of three-year races at the at the end, and um, we've got the the mile handicap earlier on in the card. This is your, a ten furlong version of it, where, like I said, quite literally anything in here has a chance. Thirteen of them going to post, and uh, a horse in the shape of Majestic, which I know that uh, Tom's been following off a cliff. Since the back end of last year, he's seven to two favourite here. Mustazid is nine to two. Lord Protector's eleven to two. Aramaic is eleven to two. Paradias is six to one. Honiton is nine to one. Moxtisarv elevens. Haunted Dreams at twelves. Uh, and like I said, it is open because uh, there are a few horses in here. I mean, Acal this time last year was winning a, uh, a, a, a a group three, 
um, by four and a half lengths over this trip on, on good ground, and he's a 50 to one outsider for new connections. So it's an interesting race, this, but Majestic, is he, um, have you, are you still following him, Tom, or are you, are you, have, you, have you kind of given up on him? Um, I don't know if I've ever really been on it in his camp. I like him because of the Cambridgeshire win, but he's been getting on my nerves a bit recently, I have to admit. So, no, he's not on my list. I mean, Ryan Moore's book for the first time, isn't he? So maybe maybe he can turn things around. But he's been running well. He's been running well in similar races. He's definitely got a chance of winning this, for sure. Uh, he wouldn't be my first choice. My first choice is Lord Protector in this, funnily enough. He's another horse I've followed over a cliff. But I actually... I'm hoping the rain stays where everyone's got him down as the sort of a mudlark. I think it's exactly the opposite. I think needs good, fast ground to be at his best. Uh, I think he's run twice at Sandown and both his best runs have been at Sandown. And he just looked like he was coming back last time when he was second to Paradis over the course and distance. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a glutton for punishment with Rafe Beckett. I always follow his horses in races like this and I haven't been doing too well with them this year despite him having loads of winners in them. I keep being on the wrong one, but... I'm hoping Lord Protector uh, gets me back on, on track here because I think he's definitely got races in him at his current mark and he loves Sander. OK, Lord Protector 11 2, Rafe Beckett just, just had a winner 10 minutes ago at Haydock for you as, uh, for as well, uh, Tom, to uh, actually give you a little bit of a boost for the Beckett camp. But yeah, Lord Protector 11 2. I quite like the horse that beat him though uh, last time out. I mean, the, the, the Youthful King and Lord Protector were quite prominent in that race. Paradis ate up the ground on the, uh, the Sandown home straight. I thought that was pretty impressive. and. One of our old friends in Honiton, in the shape, a horse we backed. Ah, yeah, Honiton. Well, if you look at his three runs this season, he's run to an RPI of 61, then 100 and something, and then 61 again. What do yeah. you do with him? Like, you know what I mean? So, and of course, he won by an absolute mile at this track last season as he well, did. didn't he? So, he's interesting. I, you know, I, to me, I couldn't. You know, I, I just just about favoured Lord Protector over Paradias because he's drawn two and Paradias is 13, but. But you know, there's not a lot between them. But there's also not a lot between Majestic and Moctasar. On yeah. York running two starts ago, Moctezuma was actually a shorter price than Majestic, and was a, just over a length behind him in fifth when, when Majestic was fourth. They both ran really well uh, in, in a high quality handicap, uh, and he's three pound better off, and he's four times the price. Now he's four times the price because he ran badly on the Weather last time, but it was only his second ever start on the Weather. I can forgive him that. And it's Chelmsford uh, as well, uh, isn't it? Yeah, it's Chelmsford as well. Like you know, obviously Majestic's run really well, but that's just. That's just showing how solid that form at York was. So I think he's, he, I think he's fairly big at a double figure price. Uh, William Knight's horse is winning quite well uh, this week yeah, as well. Yeah, they're running, they're, they're running well, yeah, they're definitely. And the other one that interested me was Trigoni. Trigoni, because he was on a, quite a roll last season, winning his last three. And I thought he was quite eye-catching when fourth at Beverly. Was it Beverly last time? I think so. Uh, it was Beverly, it yeah, was Beverly. In, in that uh, race behind Reach, which is, again, it's worked out. It hasn't thrown up a winner, but Dubai Crystal ran well at Chester, Queen of the Scars yeah. ran well at Newmarket. Yeah, it's working okay, and he was quite an icon. So I just think, he, you know, that was his first run of the season. It, 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 it was the sort of run that signified that he's still on the up. Yeah. Uh, like, you know, so he could step forward then and be, be a hand. So uh, I've had a couple of quidditch around the pair of them. Okay, fair enough. Yeah, like I said, I, I, did, I, did, I did like the way Paradis um, finished last time out, and the horse that beat him at Windsor won really nicely at Newmarket next time out. But I, I am going to have a little saver on Acal, who has won both his starts second time out in his career. Uh, last year, like I said, 10 furlongs, good ground, bolted up, beating loads of listed and group class horses, and he hasn't actually raced under those conditions since. So uh, I think he's 50 to 1 outsider, isn't he? A 33 or something, uh, Simon? He is 33 to 1. Yeah. Uh, and we are paying four places each way here, so you, know, you get that extra place. Yeah, Jamie Osborne um, had a winner today as well with Safi Osborne in the saddle, so I thought, that, thought he might be a bit big. It could go either way, but, you know, he's big enough to take yeah, a Yeah, I mean, Jim Crowley is riding outside as well, which he gives a little squeak to as well, which is Jan Tarney, who's a Charlie Appleby trained horse, and Jim and his dog, but he's had a couple of runs for Ian and is stepping up in trip here, which is the son of Dubai, Dubai he should like. Drying ground shouldn't be a problem. Once again, I'm drawing well in stall one. I've got a good record teaming up with Ian over the years. So I hope I'll continue that in another open-looking contest. And it's something I have noticed. You know, Ian, Ian does book Jim. He does seem to book Jim when he when he thinks you know the horse has got a you know, sort of good solid chance. So a twenty-five to one. I thought Jan Tarney in what looks a really open best break might be worth a few quid. Okay, Jan Tarney is a big price then for that at four fifteen. Uh, and a shout out to Hugh on the chat who says, "Yo, shout me out, Ross. This is the best show going. Paddington wins." <laughs> Uh, the previous race, of course, uh, not this one, but uh, there you go, Hugh. Uh, it turns out that actually writing your message in capitals does work, uh, but now everyone's <laughs> going to do it, and 
<laughs> it's going to go to work. It's not going to work at all, yeah. Uh, two more races at Sandown then to close out tomorrow's card, uh, both of them for the, uh, for the, the three-year-olds, uh, starting off uh, with a seven furlong handicap where New Business is 15-8 to eight favourite, Merlin the Wizard is 5-2, to two. Novus is 7-2, to two. Classic 15-2, to two. Tiger Bay 14s and 14-2 to one. Prospering 16-1, to one. and bigger the rest here uh, on paper. This should be a, a fairly decent clip, but I'm going to come to you first for this, Keels, because I'm picking up on a comment you said earlier on about Perotto. Um, it was another horse I always thought was absolutely guaranteed to be given a hold-up ride and was very prominent uh, and, uh, and ran quite well considering. And that was Novus. So I thought a little bit of a squeak here. Uh, yeah, it definitely does. I mean, was probably, probably again, did a little bit too much, didn't it? But, uh, but yeah, and that was a good race as well, wasn't it? Um, won by Coppies and, you know, yeah, he's been beating six lengths in the end, but it was 29 runners. You can't argue that, you can't argue that uh, she, sorry, she didn't run well, but I... I had a feeling that the other two might just be have a little bit more quality. Okay. Uh, Merlin the Wizard, new business. I quite like new business. I mean, he was obviously a bit of a talking horse because he was five to four for the Wood Ditton, which was won by Passenger, and he raced keenly, didn't get home. Then he raced keenly again at York, mm. didn't get home in the race won by Mostabshire impressively. Uh, and then the penny dropped when he dropped to seven furlongs last time. Uh, oh, it was only a Mickey Mouse race at Kempton, but he just did it really nicely. And I think, you know, they. I think at the start of the season they were expecting him to be a good bit better than an 87 handicapper. Yeah. And I think he may well still end up being now that they've realised that even though he's by Sea the Stars, um, he's not going to be a mile of the way he races. But for, I mean, of all the owners as well that, that have these type of horses, um, I'd say most of Sides of Hell's best horses take ages to get going. You, mm. know, you think of Dream of Dreams or even the, um, the horse that won the Beat Subjectivist in the race tomorrow at Haydock a few yeah. years ago. Yeah. It, 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 the, 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 even the really talented ones, they're very patient. Yeah, they tend to be, yeah, they tend to be slow to get going. But I, do, I just think the penny dropped a little bit last time. And yeah. you know, if there is a pace, it doesn't need to make it. But if there isn't, he can. Mm. Um, and obviously, there's no bad place to be as long as they don't have a burn up in front. So, um, yeah, I think he's the one to beat. Okay, fair enough. Uh, new business is fifteen to eight. Classics also got a chance as well. I mean, he set off four to five uh, at Goodwood behind the Foxes last year, and here he is fifteen to two for a seven furlong handicap. Tom. Yeah, I mean, it's like they all are. They're all competitive races. Uh, first look, I thought like you, Novus had a good chance. I know they were quite sweet on her chances uh, in the Sandringham, and I thought she ran well uh, there. But I just slightly worried she, that this new business is going to get. He's just going to get the run of the race off the front. He'll love. I don't think he'd want any rain. Most either styles don't really like a lot of rain. They prefer it. So that would be the worry with him. But I think he's got the potential to be a lot better than his handicap mark. So he'd be my most. He'd be the one I think is the most likely winner. But I am very interested in Novus, although I was expecting it to be a lot. Yeah, fair enough. Uh, Ryan Moore and Gary Moore teaming up as well. Um, Simon uh, Clare with the penultimate race on tomorrow's card. Yeah, I'm a nervous man. Um, Brian Moore's got a really strong book. He rides Martin in the charge. Must have a great chance. Probably wins the Coroquits on Pennington, unless Emily Upton wins. And rides Majestic in the last race, which is a, a fancied, uh, obviously well fancied. So he could be one of those days where Ryan Moore has a real, really sort of red letter day. But uh, but I fancy nervous. Always a crack. Run at Royal Ascot. Run well at Goodwood or, you know, in a tough little battle time before. I think she'll go well again here. OK, uh, and then the, the last race on the card tomorrow is the, the 5.25, another three-year-old handicap, this time over 10 furlongs, uh, where uh, Ryan Moore has a, uh, another ride in the shape of Liz Boa, but uh, that's a 15-2 to two shot, and it's in Transman, who's 9-2 to two at the top of the betting. Orchestra, it's 5-1, to one. Uh, Ribal is 6-1, to one. Romensky 13-2, to two. Liz Boa is 15-2, to two. Miller Spirit 8s, Blue Yonder 8s, Abu Royal 10s, uh, and, uh, and bigger prices the rest. And um, this is probably the race that you, you're got the least opinion on Tom but it's the race I've got the most notes on I've got notes on <laughs> nearly every runner in this race um, picking out the winner is going to be a be one thing but I tell you what at some point I will have made a note saying that was a future winner because I've got them on <laughs> 8 of the 10 <laughs> yeah I mean as Sai said there Liz, uh, Ryan Moore's got a good book of eyes I bet he wasn't I wish he wasn't on Liz Bow and I <laughs> bet he wished he was on uh, Gary Moore's other his, his dad's other horse Miller Spirit because I think he's got a good chance Miller Spirit I think he's well handicapped. I've, he's been a big eye catcher, I think, nearly every time he's run. I would imagine, you know, the Moors would have, boss, you know, have eyed up a race like this on a big card. They do it all the time with these three-year-olds. I remember them having a you know, one winner at Goodwood not that long ago, and it's, you know, a similar type of horse. I just think Miller Spirit's got plenty of improvement in him. 
uh, and that he would be one of my stronger fences on the card. Actually, I think he'll run really, really well at Eaton. Yeah, yeah, he, was, yeah. That, that Clan Chieftain yeah. race looked a good one, didn't it? Um, it was very... Did you have notes on him? What's that? Did you have notes on Miller's spirit? I did. I said massive, massively outran its odds in a really good race at Chepstow behind Clan Chieftain that would throw up future winners. So yeah, he he was he was one of three main ones on the list here. There was the other one was um, the uh, the Jarvis horse. Uh, yeah. Yardo had a win last year at Hakuna Bay. That you know, four to copies, four to wild side, never in it last time I had at Windsor, but there's plenty of ten furlong and twelve furlong form in uh, in her pedigree and I thought she was really interesting. She's a fairly big price as well. Uh, but uh, in Transmit nine two I thought Orchestra is probably the solid one. Ten furlongs, good ground. <sighs> it, it, you know, how do you say something's that solid when there's that little form to go on? They're all very lightly raced, yeah. all over to loads of improvement. I mean I think you know, I think if it chucks it down, entrancement could end up going up fairly short because obviously a mud lover won very easily on soft ground last year. Yeah. Gagged up on uh, on heavy ground last time. David Manuissier loves running decent horses at Sandown. Yeah. He's got twenty nine percent strike rate in handicaps at Sandown, which is remarkable. <laughs> it's absolutely sixty nine percent profit. I'm um, yeah. just backing them blind. I mean, it's incredible. So uh, you've definitely got to keep an eye on that one. And I'm also very interested in Rebel now. He's been gelded. I don't know what happened to him last time when he was, uh, you know, well beaten behind Coverdale in a, in a class four handicap. But his second, you know, Doncaster Maiden uh, at the start of the season was fine. His third to military order uh, on his second of two starts last year, the, the winner being now being rated 110. Mm. Uh, and he's in here off a very low mark of 79. He's been gelded. Um, so, and again, if you backed every single horse in you know, in the last what, 13, 14 years trained by Aldrew Balding in handicaps at Sandown, you'd have also made a profit. Yeah. Like, you know, not quite so much as, as you would have done with Manuissier, but he's run considerably more and he just has lots of winners yeah. in Sandown handicaps. Yeah, and the horse just one place ahead of rebound was Feud, who was the Beckett horse that's just won at Haydock tonight as well. So that form has been given a little bit of a boost. Simon Clare, see us out with the 5.25, please. Yeah, it's a very competitive race. Obviously, you know, relatively unexposed horses. Jim Crowley rides the outside of the field, Mythical Guest, and he, he makes a case for, for a Mythical Guest thing. Two rounds, two rounds ago, around good third at Newmarket over this 10th on trip. Uh, set number trip last time didn't seem to suit him. Dropping back is no surprise. George Markson is a shrewd operator. Uh, and this is another race where I could run into a plate. So he sort of gives a little case for mythical guess. Uh, but yeah, looks frighteningly contested. So uh, I'd probably just follow Jim and uh, cheer him on. Okay, lovely stuff. Uh, and we'll get the naps in a second. But before we do, uh, obviously we're going to have you know a, another big Group One winner tomorrow. We're, we're approaching the middle of the flat season so far. So uh, I just want to say, of all the Group One horses this year so far, uh, England, Ireland, France, wherever you want, Tom, is the one that you're you're steadfastly on the side of. Like I said, you've said that you're not sure about Tahira and that maybe the three-year-old Colts aren't that up, up, up to up to scratch as well. What, what's your Group One horse for this year? Uh, well, I, to be honest, I'm, I don't think there's been any. Really, one sort of taking my breath. I thought Emily Upjohn put up the best performance I've seen this season in the in the uh, uh, Coronation Cup. I like Coronation Monomi a bit, just with his three runs. I love the Gold Cup. I just thought that was a, you know, that was a brilliant performance against some rock solid horses. I'd love to see him against Kiprios next year, and I think I think that, you know I like staying races, so he'd be top of my list at the moment. Okay, uh, Keels, your Group One horse of the year? Yeah, I mean, it, it's one of those, isn't it? Like Tom, I don't think I, I don't think we've seen anything absolute standout-ish. But the one I enjoyed the most, or, or in hindsight, have enjoyed the most, is Shaquille's win in the uh, uh, in the Commonwealth Cup um, because you know it taught me a lesson. Um, you know, to, you know, don't make excuses for when horses are beaten. Sometimes, I mean, I like making excuses when they're a big price. Yeah, but uh, you know, noble. Uh, Neville Style. Neville Style got well thumped by Shaquille and I got convinced that he'd turn it around and Shaquille, even though he flopped out of the stalls, came out and won easy. He's a very good horse and of course it's great to see a smaller stable and the limelight at Royal Ascot as well. So yeah. uh, good yard, do really you know, do really well with their horses, um, sprinters particularly. So yeah, I enjoyed that. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. And um, even, I mean, even though he was a little bit disappointed with Curry the other day, I mean, August Rodan at Epsom was absolutely spectacular. Mm. I do think this year's Derby was 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 just a very, very good race. And the way he powered clear down the middle after that uh, that Newmarket flop, um, you know, will we'll live long in the memory. It was one of the, the most impressive Derby winners of uh, in recent memory. Simon, your Group One horse of the season so far? Yeah, listen, I thought. But I was thinking of this. I thought I think Paddington and Emily Upton are up there as 
some of the most guys, you know, the best performances so far. We've got two of them in the both of them in the Coral Eclipse, which is great. But I think most of that winning the Prince of Wales. You know, Jim Crowley, obviously Coral Ambassador, and um, beating a good field, and he'll run next to the Judd Bond team. He's a horse who's kind of always threatened to you know, break into the big time, and that win certainly. You'd like to, you know, if he, if he can back that up and, and win the Judd Bond team and go on to be one of the best horses of the season, that'd be great. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, lovely stuff. Right, uh, we'll be, uh, I mean, given Mossadaf's better as well, I'm not going to trip to the Breeders' Cup, might well, uh, might well suit him. He might go have a nice time over there, and you could be joining him, potentially. Oh, yes, that's definitely. I'm... Oh. Yes, of course, it was the universal you, not specifically. That's not clever. Maybe I should have yes, made that. I will be there. That's right. <laughs> I, should have, I should have made that more obvious, yeah. You lucky devil, Tiger. It's the breeder's cup. <laughs> Would you really want to go, Tom? Would no. you really want to go? No, absolutely not. Well, you've been to more breeder's cups than I have to eclipse this. You've been to more breeders' cups <laughs> than you've been in, into the racing post offices, Tom. <laughs> but uh, anyway, let's get the naps. On Coral Eclipse Day, shall we? Uh, Saturday's best bets of the day from the panel, starting off with Paul Keeley. Uh, yeah, at Sandown, get ahead in the opening Coral Charge. Um, absolute nap of the day is Maxud in the old Newton Cup, though. Okay, there we go. All right, Tom? Uh, the last one in the last race, forgotten its name, Gary Moore's horse, Pearl Miller, Miller, something, whatever. What Miller Spirit. Called? Miller Spirit. Miller Spirit. Miller Spirit, yeah, I like that one. Okay, there we go. Uh, I'll go for Baxi Dar in the distaff. And what about you, Simon Clare? Oh, I was going to go for Stenson Glad in the distaff, but I won't, or I think she will win. You can if you want, I it's all right. Go for... No, no, I'll go for Novus. I think Novus will win, the Gary Moore horse with uh, Ryan Moore on board. Okay, lovely stuff. Well, there we go. Uh, we hope you enjoy uh, Sandown on Saturday. Uh, hopefully the Coral Eclipse will throw up a cracking finish and we'll see you uh, in, a, uh, in, a, in a couple of uh, couple of weeks. couple of weeks? couple of weeks. King, King George, George, isn't it? King yeah, George. yeah, King George. Which is, Three weeks. Three yeah, weeks which is it. It's, quite, yeah, it's, it's right at the back end of July this oh. year, isn't it? Uh, so uh, enjoy the weekend. We'll, uh, we'll see you next time.